Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. I tell you what, in going through this story of the lineage of David, I'm deciding who needs TV? You don't need it. You've got everything that you need. You've got drama. You've got tragedy. You've got all sorts of things going on here. So let's enter the story today. So last week, we discussed how God confronted David's sin of rape and murder through the prophet Nathan. And Nathan was bold and shared truth to power in a very real way. Um, That's something I've always respected about Nathan, his ability to do that with uh, confidence, with faith, with boldness, Um, and it's actually the the inspiration for why we named our son Nathan, uh, was for the prophet Nathan, because wanted that kind of uh, boldness uh, to be a part of his life as well. Um, David's response to Nathan, and in the psalm from last week, was one of remorse and repentance, which is something good for David. Um, but as in the warning from Nathan, the damage that he had caused was done, and it would be felt in his family. That brings us to our passage for this week. To help you understand it, though, we need to back up a little bit so that we can set the stage for what is happening between David and his son Absalom. If we jump back to chapter 13... We see the pattern of of sin demonstrated by David beginning to take root in his own family. David's son, Amnon, falls in love with uh, with a sister of Absalom, who is also one of David's sons, which makes her Amnon's half-sister. Her name was Tamar. Now, rather than requesting to marry Tamar, Amnon chooses to rape her instead and then turn her loose in disgrace and push her away. Needless to say, Absalom, her brother, was pretty angry. After some time, he hatched a plan to kill his brother Amnon, and he followed through with that plan. From that point, he had to go into hiding. He ran uh, from the kingdom. He was not a part of it. But he was eventually forgiven by David and restored to his ranking as one of David's sons. After being restored, Absalom, who was very charismatic and popular, began to sow seeds of discontent with his father's rule. He would actually hang outside of the courts where people would come uh, to find justice Uh, from the king and talk to people about, well, you know, he's not really going to give you the justice that you're looking for, but if I were king, I would obviously give you the justice that you are, are looking for, and he sowed those seeds of discontent. Over time, Absalom won over the hearts of many in the kingdom and set his eyes on killing his father and establishing himself as king. One of the things that I love in confirmation, and thank you, Bryant, for sharing today, are the Bibles that we're able to give to the kids. Um, And there's a reason for this. One, it gives them the story, but two, there's wonderful things in here that help set the stage for them to understand the story. So one of the things that I did in preparing for the sermon is look to see uh, in here what it might have to offer. And I wanted to share with you what the confirmands would read uh, if they were pulling up this passage to look at. And it says, selfishness and hurting others. In this heartbreaking tale of Absalom's rebellion against his father, against his father David, we see the deep consequences of sin. 2 Samuel shows how David's personal failure with Bathsheba, adultery, and murder creates divisions in his family uh, that that then extend to the nation at large. David took what he wanted without concern for the people who would get hurt, and that led his own sons to do the same. Absalom's rebellion against his father temporarily shatters the nation's unity and causes a lot of suffering. 
the effects of sin are not limited to the one who commits the action. There can be great unintended consequences. The great consequence in this case is where we find ourselves in today's passage. David is in anguish over the knowledge that his son wants to kill him, and he continues to be haunted and punished for his past sins. To add another layer to our already tangled web, we are introduced to another character by the name of Ahithophel, uh, which translated means brother of foolishness. Ahithophel was once a counselor to David, and some scholars believe he was the grandfather of Bathsheba, but we're, there's debate on that. Uh, but it definitely would add an interesting twist to our story. He switched over, Ahithophel switched over and became a counselor for Absalom, uh, and is the one who offers the advice to Absalom to gather an army to go and kill David while he is down. I want to take one moment to highlight verse 23 from chapter 16. It says, Now in those days the advice Ahithophel gave was like that of one who inquires of God. That was how both David and Absalom regarded all of Ahithophel's advice. He was like that of one who inquires of God. Now, last week we talked about Nathan. His story was coming straight from God. The reason he was going to David is because God sent him, not because of advice that he had or whatever. It was God inspired him to go and confront David because it was something God wanted. Ahithophel was one of those people that they looked up to as if he was a prophet, but he was not. The advice coming from Ahithophel was coming from someplace different. Maybe he was Bathsheba's grandfather, and this was an act of revenge. We don't know. But the advice coming from him, even though they were accepting it as though it were from a prophet or someone like a prophet, uh, it was not. So where we find ourselves now in our story with David is with Israel in crisis. There's turmoil in David's household stemming from his own past transgressions, and it's threatening, um, which is threatening to kill David and put the kingdom in jeopardy under the rule of his son, Absalom. Are you able to keep up with all this so far? <laughs> I know it's a lot, and it's a tangled web, and we've got all these different pieces going on in the story, but it is a tragic story that is about David, who is regarded to be one of the greatest and most respected kings of Israel, a man after God's own heart. David, as God warned of all kings, though, was human, imperfect, and sinful, he also loved God and was willing to repent, trust in God's ju judgment, and pray for God's forgiveness continually. I think these are lessons for our own lives and our own families. We need to be mindful that the sins we commit and the mistakes we make do not just harm us, but can harm others as well. The other danger is that they can create a pattern of harm that can continue beyond us, just as we see going on in David's family. This is where the challenging work comes in for all of us. David was vulnerable, raw, and open with the prophet Nathan and with God over being confronted with his sin. What might have happened if he could have been that raw and open with his sons and his family about what had taken place? What change may have taken place? Maybe his son Amnon could have learned from his father's mistake and not continued in the same footsteps, causing another chain reaction that would then lead to a situation where not only David's family was in crisis, but the entire kingdom was in crisis. We have a responsibility ourselves to atone for our mistakes and sins, but an even greater responsibility to safeguard against the ripple effect that may be caused by our sin. In this season, 
as we are preparing to gather with our families and loved ones to share a meal and give thanks, and as we look toward and prepare for the gift of Emmanuel, let us take some time to reflect upon, to pray over, and act on our discipleship commitment for today. If we can look at that real quick. In this time leading up to Thanksgiving and Advent, I'm asking for all of us to find ways to heal wounds, to restore wholeness, and to trust in God. Those are the pieces that David talked about for his own life, for how he was going to try and repent and make amends for his own actions in his relationship with God. But it was also important for him to try and do that within his family, within his kingdom. Our families, our world around us are affected by the decisions that we make. This is an awesome time as we're remembering the things that we have to be thankful for, as we're preparing for the gift that God is to us, as we experience that in Emmanuel through Christmas. Maybe this can be a time for us to prayerly reflect upon the things that we can do to restore our families, restore our faith, and make amends for things that have done, but also to shore things up and to strengthen things and to not let it just be a personal healing of wholeness, but a corporate feeling of wholeness for our lives and our families and those around us. So prayerfully consider that as you go forth this week. Amen? Amen.